You have heard the news and seen the devastation in pictures. More than 5,000 people dead and millions left homeless after Typhoon Haiyan battered the central Philippines on November the 8th. And now one month since Haiyan hit, the Chinese Asia team is uh, back in the area in Tacloban, one of the worst hit cities, to understand how far it has pulled back from the devastation. Well, our reporter Jack Board is there right now. He joins us live from Tacloban. Uh, Jack, it's good to see you. Now, tell us, uh, what can you see at the moment? Good morning, guys. I'm standing on the shoreline of Tacloban right now. Behind me, you can see just the immense amount of damage that was caused by the typhoon here. And all around us as well, people starting to pick up the pieces, starting to rebuild. It's difficult to imagine where to even begin. Yeah, one month on, that's exactly what's happening. People walking through this, this debris, trying to salvage whatever they can. You, you might ask, why even try? Why not move on, move to a different location? But on mornings like this, you can really appreciate just how idyllic it is here in Tacloban, right across Lete province. It is a beautiful area. The, the water here is like a, a sheet of glass, and that's exactly why people want to stay, and they want to renew their lives um, from this point on. Well, well, Jack, you mentioned rebuilding efforts. Uh, I mean, how challenging will it be for the folks there? As we know, understand that logistics are still a big issue, and it doesn't look like there's any uh, heavy equipment around that can uh, sort of help them through that process. Mm. Yeah, you're right, Stephen. It seems like an impossible task. Travelling around Tacloban, the damage is... It's hard to describe, actually. Every single building that you see has some form of damage. I mean, all around us here, there's concrete and metal structures that have been totally knocked over. Um, so it's hard, it's hard to see what sort of time frame it's going to require to get these people back, give them some temporary shelters for now, but it's going to take months, if not years, um, for this process to really get going. Already now people are just doing their best to get something, some kind of roof over their heads using the basic materials that they have. Hardware is starting to flow into Tacloban. Basic tools that people need to, to get their lives back on track. Uh, aid was a big issue just a couple of weeks ago when we were in the Philippines and from the base in Cebu, that was the logistics hub of this aid operation. The logjam that was a huge issue then seems to have been released and now in Tacloban, they have the resources that they need. They have food and they have materials. So the progress that has been made over the past few weeks is, is remarkable, in fact. The roads are clear now. You can easily access most parts of the city. Driving around is like you're in a normal city, except there's this contrast either side of you. It's just complete devastation in terms of buildings, trees still lying across, power lines down. So... We can see the progress starting to happen now, but as I said, it, it will take a long time before uh, normality returns here. Okay, a good description there, Jack. Do stay on the line there because we have uh, our colleague Steve Clark in studio right now to talk to us. Because, Steve, you were in the Philippines covering the disaster for some 11 days. I'm listening to what Jack is saying. Um, how have things changed since what you saw? When we were there, it was primarily a primary emergency response. Uh, now, from what Jack has been saying, it looks like they're... I don't think they should have properly reached the secondary response, but they're probably transitioning to secondary relief response. And that means looking at infrastructure. You've got past the essential food and supplies and medical um, kits, uh, hygiene kits that should be, be given up to these people just to survive on a daily basis. It looks more now like they're starting to transition to the secondary right. phase. But what, what struck you when you, when you first arrived there? I mean, uh, we've seen some images now of how it is. And, and you know, when you think back to those uh, four weeks ago when you were there, what, what struck you? I was sort of where Jack is standing in Tacloban. Um, I remember standing in Giwan, which is the next island over Sama, standing in a place called Barangay Number no. 9, on those jetties and in the water. and almost the exact same thing. You can imagine very lively jetties and fishing families going out, doing the things and taking their excess to market and things like that. And just 
totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Well, maybe maybe we can bring Jack back in for a moment. I mean, Jack, we can, if we can ask you, because you're, you're at the point where you mentioned the sea and how, you know, we know fishing very much a part of their livelihood there. Do you see any signs of that coming back? Are there, are there fishermen going out? Are there people trying to, you know, as you meant, uh, get things back to normal? Oh, well, look, Stephen, from what I can see, no. I can't see anyone going about their normal business here. It seems like the main focus is that people just need to to start getting their personal lives back in order and that means trying to salvage some kind of shelter get their personal belongings back in order and it seems you know a month on and this is taking a, a long time i spent a, a quite an amount of time up in bantayan it's in the north of cebu and we took a close look at some of the local industries there remember that they are rural areas this is more of a city in the rural areas they heavily rely on fishing and on chickens, on banana plantations, coconuts, those industries have been totally wiped out. And for them, it's, it's critical that they get those industries back going because that's what people rely on for their food and for their income. In a city, the situation is somewhat different. Obviously, fishing is important here, but once food starts to return and people are able to start working again, that process is just a little bit different. So from here, I, ca I can't see anyone going about fishing or, or starting to work again. It's uh, the city is sort of uniting in this recovery effort. Mm. Well, Jack, you have been back there since Saturday and talking to the locals, no doubt. Tell us, uh, what are people saying? What's the general mood there like? Look, uh, Yvonne, it's certainly sober, but people really are optimistic. We attended a mass, a grand mass held at the city's Santa Nino church yesterday really was an emotional experience and the people we spoke to said they just wanted to to give thanks that they were still alive they've been given a second opportunity at life they can now move on um, obviously paying respects to the 2200 people alone who were killed in Tacloban still and praying for the 800 people who were still missing but certainly there is a sense of optimism and that's one thing I'll certainly take from this entire experience in the Philippines is this incredible sense of unity people working together, they're helping themselves out, helping each other out, their neighbours. Um, it really is an incredible sight to see and something that we can certainly learn from. Uh, Jack, Jack, can I, can I just ask, you You mentioned the, the spirit of the Philippine people there. Uh, I have to concur from my experience. I, just, I was told a word called disgate. It's uh, unravelling a very complex problem, something which you were uh, talking about at the top of the segment here. Um, the people when, that I was speaking to, they were pulling nails out of debris to put together temporary huts. Now, I'm sure in Tacloban they were doing the same thing. Are people getting the, the shelter now that was being promised but being held up in the early days? Are people getting tents and even prefabricated housing to live in? Yeah, Steve, I think you're right. That is starting to happen now. Obviously, there's a lot of activity behind me and people who have homes along this shoreline want to move back to their to where they're used to living. It's probably a, a level of personal comfort to themselves. But just on the other side here is the large evacuation centre. It's the city's Astrodome. It was one of the first evacuation centres set up in the immediate aftermath of the typhoon. And it's one of 11 that are still in operation here. But that's down from 39 that were set up. Uh, during the most immediate uh, period afterwards. So these evacuation centres are being wound down now. People are moving out. Their areas are being cleaned up and they're being moved to the tent cities. There's a huge NGO presence here still and the tent cities are providing people with more of the daily essentials and the comforts that they need if they can't move back to their homes. Remember, there are hundreds of thousands of people in this city. It's a huge number of people who don't have shelter and these tent cities, from what we can see, are providing people with what they require at the moment. Well, well, Steve, let me ask you about that. I mean, you said there were people pulling out nails from the debris to, to rebuild some homes or temporary shelters, you know, and, and the spirit of the people there. I mean, we've heard about many stories of how many other uh, Filipinos from all over the world, you know, very wanting very much to help, doing miraculous things. I mean, when you were there, did you feel that there was this resilience of the people that you know that, you know, given time, they'll be back on their feet and back to normal? You know, in the rural areas where, where we were, in Samar and uh, Leyte, people haven't lost that ability.
to be able to do things for themselves. They're not going to call a contractor to fix their toilet. You know, they're going to be have that ability to pull nails out of debris and to be able to think like that, not say, when are we going to get help? They just pick up and they start doing it. And I think that's what Jack's talking about. When you're there, you cover these things sometimes and you feel like a real outsider, almost like a rat. Really, you do. Uh, but when, when we were there, people were happy. They were not happy, that's the wrong word, but they were just getting on and being cheerful about it, saying, look, okay, we've got to deal with this, and they have the ability to do so. And that's what made, for me, the assignment uh, a, a joy, and I think that's what Jack's uh, inferring as well. What's the future you see for them? Um, will there be jobs and schools for them? <laughs> It's going to take some time. Um, I asked, and I felt a little silly afterwards, I asked the principal, you know, when are you going to reopen your school? And he just gave me the answer, how to reopen a building which is no longer there. Mm. It's, it's going to take a long time. Then, if you look at secondary and tertiary effects on people's lives, what about the psychological damage? Mm. Um, following a, a man-made thing, the financial crisis in Indonesia, people were suffering for years for, uh, mentally about how to deal with their lives and maybe this is going to get that side of the story is going to get buried for a while underneath all the other chat but yeah, that yeah. is a very yeah. strong aspect of the story the social impact okay. the economic impact as yes. well thanks a lot yeah. steve for joining us this morning and also jack ward reporting from takleban live on the situation there one month on after typhoon haiyan hit the philippines thanks, thanks jack. Jack as well well the update on the situation in